Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have those of you that are joining us live. Jumping on, we're going to give you a little bit of time for the participants to jump on, but um, just want to say hello and good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carrie Weber, uh, owner and president of the Jameson Group, and I'm so pleased to have been invited to join Lee Tesler of Cirrus Consulting Group this evening. Uh, the Cirrus Consulting Group and Jameson Group, we have been... Uh, friends, the companies have been friends for, for several years now. And so um, we, we love to collaborate and have these kinds of presentations at least once a year so that we can um, connect with all of you out there that are looking to, to learn and to grow and to make the most of your businesses, your dental businesses. So Lee, thank you so much for the invitation to join you this evening. My pleasure. So I'm going to start out just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A section, whatever you have accessible to you in this in this webinar. And Lee and I will make sure that we are uh, trying to keep track of that as we present. I get to go first. I drew I drew the go first straw, and then Lee's going to take it take it from from that completion. But to start out, we have some polls for poll questions for you. So if you all can answer these questions for us. Um, a lot of these, for those of you who are familiar with, with Cirrus Consulting Group, Cirrus is the expert in lease negotiations um, for your dental practices and helping you make the most out of those out of those lease arrangements that you have. And at Jameson, we are business hygiene consulting firm, and we also provide full service dental marketing to dentists and teams across the country in the United States and in multiple countries. And so it's a it's a fun collab we're doing tonight. Um, so some of these questions are um, about your your lease and your arrangements um, for your dental practices. And so I know that Lee would I mean Lee would love to to have the this information and insight as he picks up in the second half of the presentation. So please feel free to complete those questions for us. So let's get started. We are gathered here together to talk about how we can get focused for practice growth. How can we help find profit in your practices? And so two very unique um, perspectives between Lee and I on, on this topic. And so I hope that it's full of great insights for all of you that are participating with us live. And if you are watching this recording later, um, I hope it's helpful for you as well. Um, I know that Lee and the Cirrus team will share some contact information for you from them, but this is the contact information for me. If you see something or if you hear me bring something up in my portion of the presentation and you have questions or you'd like to receive that information, um, this is my email. This is Jameson's website, and that's my social media uh, address on Instagram. So uh, please feel welcome to reach out to me however is convenient to you. Um, I'm going to offer you several things in my portion of the presentation, so I certainly want you to have access to those if you should desire them. So let's get started. I am a big fan of Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he talks about this. I love this quote from the book. If you can get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. So if any of you have read the book, Atomic Habits, the main concept of the book is that the way we can accomplish our goals or get to where we want to be is by creating and building upon small disciplines along the way. Uh, so for all of us in dentistry, I think it's pretty obvious that we are running a marathon. <laughs> this is not a sprint. And so a lot of the things that Lee and I are going to talk about this evening are for that long game. How can we set ourselves up to be more successful, to be more profitable, to be in healthier relationships with the companies, the businesses, the landlords, um, the resources that we need to stay open and to run as a business? And so we want you to start at the risk of overusing a cliche. We want you to work smarter, not harder. 
And so that's what I think Mr. Clear is talking about here. Let's look for the 1% opportunities that you can start implementing or evaluating or negotiating right now so that when you look into the future, when you look into 2025, when you look at the end of the year, when you look three years ahead, what are the differences that you want to see happening in your profit margin, in your practice performance, in your team culture, in your patient base, whatever the case may be, in your facility, whatever the case may be, let's start building strategy now so you can get 1% better each day. All it takes is 1%. So think about that. If you think about at Jameson, we talk primarily about what are 25 integral systems in your practice. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But what I always say is, you know, some of these are big systems like scheduling. Some of them are uh, more philosophical systems like leadership. Um, but if we improved in each of those systems by simply by 1% in the next six months, that's a 25% increase in your practices, production, profit, performance, whatever the case may be. So let's start thinking in those James Clear type perspectives of the tiny disciplines we can improve upon to help us be better down the road. So when we think about increasing profit margin, there are really three ways, if we were to simplify it, that you can do that in your practices. You can increase production, increase your fees, or decrease your costs. Now, it could be a combination of these. Boy, if you could do all of these things, you are living large. You are going to see huge, huge leaps in your practice numbers. But it, for you, I want you to start thinking like the Sherlock Holmes of your practice. When you think about your profit margin, when you think about your practice performance, where are the opportunities? When was the last time you increased your fees or did a fee analysis? When was the last time you reviewed your case presentation and treatment acceptance numbers? How's your patient retention? What's the churn rate of your patients? What are your costs? What are your overhead numbers? Are you in a healthy range in your practice numbers? When you think about that, you can start looking for opportunities to either decrease your costs or increase the productivity of your practice. At Jameson, we teach what we call the critical factors of the business of dentistry. We work through these with dentists and teams and their practices day after day, because, you know, if you really understand the ownership of a business, we are continuously improving. There is no end until you retire or sell your practice. We are continuously looking for ways to improve to grow, to refine, to sharpen, and so on. So if you looked at these items in your practice regularly and intentionally, these are the critical factors that are turning the wheels of your practice. Your production. Are you setting production goals? Are, is your team aware of those goals daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? Are we hitting those goals or are we struggling to hit those goals? collection. I want you to collect what you produce. Now, those of you that are heavy in PPO, this is real challenging for you because the write-offs that you're experiencing most of the time is probably cutting your practice numbers in half. And so it's really important for you to be measuring your collection numbers and your production numbers. And if you are in network with dental insurance plans, you need to understand what relationships you're in and what that's doing in your business. I'm not saying that you have to get out of them, but I am saying you need to know what games you're playing. Um, a lot of practices sign up for plans years ago and have no idea what that's really doing in their practice and, and to their health, their health and happiness. So I need you to know what you're producing, what you're collecting, what's your accounts receivable. If you let that accounts receivable start to snowball, you're in trouble, girls and guys. So when you start getting past the 90 day past due mark, how easy is it for you to collect on those monies? Not very easy. So what we need to do is have an intentional process and system in place 
for your AR so that you're not only tracking it, but you're collecting and you're staying on top of those AR numbers. So do you know what your accounts receivable are? And are is it snowballing for you or do you have it under control? Patient financing, are you utilizing it in your practice? Are you maximizing it in your practice? A lot of people have it. It's not like it's some unknown entity anymore. Care credit, there's plenty of patient financing companies out there but you're not using it. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know. You're not using it to the best of your ability. Think of it this way. If we're thinking about it in the 1% category, what I hear from many of my friends in the patient financing space is when you look at dentistry that's diagnosed and incomplete, not accepted in your practice, there is a high likelihood that at least 10% of those patients could say yes if patient financing was presented to them as an option. So if you could get 10% of your diagnosed and incomplete unaccepted treatment to move forward because you offered patient financing, would that be a benefit for the productivity and profitability of your practice? That's a question that you need to start looking at. And if you are in relationship with patient financing companies, I recommend that you reach out to them and you have them do reports on your utilization and where your opportunities are in your, in your practice for maximizing that tool and that resource for your patients. Remember this, based upon care credit and synchrony financial studies, it's very difficult for patients to pay out of pocket anything over $500. So if that is the case, how powerful is patient financing as an option to help your patients afford the dentistry they want or need? So take a look at how you're utilizing or not patient financing in your practice. Your overhead, as I talked about, this is going to be a big one for many of you. It's important that you know salaries are going to likely typically are the highest percentage of your overhead. That makes sense. Also lab and supplies and your rent. <laughs> so it's important that you know what you're in relationship with it with your lease, like Lee and his friends at Cirrus do, but it's also important to think bigger than just the leasing of the space. And that's what Lee's going to talk about. There's a lot of opportunity for you to maximize the agreements that you're in for your benefit financially. So I want Lee to be able to speak to that. I'm not going to talk too much about that, promise Lee. And so, but what I want you to think about is Am I in healthy windows of what is the norm and the and the the safe and and common averages in my overhead numbers? These are numbers that you can find if you want to email me and ask. I'm happy to share what we have, but it's important that you know and making sure that you're not skewed and and way out of balance in your overhead and that we're tracking the costs because your cash flow is key. <laughs> the only money that you really have is the money that's left in the bank after you pay all of your expenses. And so if you have no money left, who pays the salaries? Who pays the lease? And so if you aren't keeping track of that, you are flying blind. And I do not recommend that you do that as a business owner. It'll turn around and bite you in the you know what, if you're not careful. Your scheduling. Are you scheduling to production goals? Are you scheduling in a healthy way where you're taking into consideration doctor assistant time so that we aren't double booking our doctors or our hygienists where they are supposed to be in two places at once? Are we documenting effectively so that we all are prepared for our appointments in the way that we should be? Are we doing all of the pieces of what we call the essentials of scheduling to make sure that you have stable growth? And that the roller coaster of your days is reduced. And um, that's what causes the stress, right? When you have all of the cancellations and no-shows, when one day you have a really full schedule and the next day it's crickets, what we want is consistency. How do you get consistency in your schedule? You start to have consistency in your scheduling. So I want you to start looking at your schedule from the perspective of, Am I scheduling to productivity, profitability, and reduced stress? That's what I want for you. Broken appointments and no-shows are a big piece that are tied to scheduling. Um, this is a piece I have lectured 
so much this year on the topic of broken appointments and no-shows. It's not even funny. Why? Because everybody is struggling with this. And so what I want you to think about is it's not just what we're doing reactively to deal with when broken appointments and no-shows occur. I need you to rewind the day and look at what you're doing beforehand to prevent them. We want to be proactive in as much of the processes of our practice as possible versus reactive. So what are we doing in our scheduling efforts, in our pre-appointing efforts, in our patient checkouts, in our verbal skills to strengthen the sense of value and commitment that our patients have to the appointments they're saying yes to in scheduling? That's what I want us to start taking a look at as a team on how can we do this better? Case acceptance, as I said earlier, is a big one. Uh, you know, at Jameson, for years, we have said that we want you to get 85% treatment acceptance. Well, the reality is the majority of doctors are probably seeing closer to 35, 40% case acceptance. And so what I want you to think about is don't let that big number overwhelm you if you're not there yet. This is the power of goal setting. Wherever you are now, I want you to start setting incremental goals that are higher than that, that you and your team are striving to reach. Once you start trending on hitting those goals, then I want you to heighten it again. Well, Carrie, how do I get more case acceptance? I feel like every time I ask a patient that, you know, if, the, if that's the kind of treatment they want, they tell me they'll think about it or they tell me yes, but they never scheduled the appointment. Sounds to me like we have glitches in our treatment presentation and our financial arrangements process. And so what you need to do is as a team, start to evaluate how you're presenting treatment to patients, how you're moving them from treatment presentation to financial conversations, and then how do we move them into a true yes, not an I'll think about it yes, so that you have more patients saying yes to dentistry, completing that dentistry, paying for that dentistry, staying active in your practice and referring others. That's what we want. Hygiene. I want 33%. I want a third of your practice production, if you're a general practice, to be coming from your hygiene department. So what are we doing to focus on not only hygiene performance, but the hygienist role in treatment acceptance and in supporting doctor's diagnosis for recommended treatment to help those patients that are in the hygiene chair move to restorative when needed. New patients. How many new patients are you getting every month? Where are they coming from? Are you tracking this? If you're investing in external marketing, is it working for you? If you're not tracking where your new patients are coming from, how do you even know? And so we want to make sure we're setting healthy new patient numbers based upon what you want to achieve in production and practice growth and in your schedule. Do you have a cohesive, high-performing team? Is the attitude of the practice positive? Is the culture healthy? These elements on the team side are so critical for the rest of the pieces of the critical factors of the business of dentistry to even be accomplished. If we have a disengaged negative team, none of the other things are ever going to happen. That's how important your team and your practice culture are. So you need to start investigating and evaluating how are we truly doing. My mother, Kathy Jamison, who is the founder of the Jamison Group, says this, the success of your practice is in direct proportion to the success of your systems. James Clear says, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So what are we doing to help support your vision, your goals for your practice? If you have no systems and processes in place, you can't accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish. And that's where burnout, frustration, and stress all root from. So when you think about boosting momentum and profitability in your practice, think about what you're doing in these four areas. How are you attracting patients into your practice? Are you getting a good number of referrals from the patients that you already have? Referrals are the best type of new patients. So are we getting 60% of our new patients every month by way of referral? What are you doing to attract the right types of patients for you? Not only are we attracting them, but are we keeping them? The ADA said recently in a study that 
four, only four out of 10 new patients stay active in that practice. So there's a huge opportunity for improvement simply by delivering an exceptional new patient experience that not only builds the value for the treatment you're recommending, but builds relationship and trust for that patient to stay an active member of your patient family. Elevating your services. Dentistry is more and more competitive every day. What are you doing to compete with everyone down the road? But in addition to that, if you're looking to increase profit, you need to increase the types of services that you provide. There are so many incredible services that you could make available in your practice today. What interests you? Invisalign, cosmetic dentistry, implants, whatever you could and want to add on, what do you need to do to make that an integral part of your practice to elevate the profitability? And your elevated communication skills, your entire team's ability to communicate is key in your ability to accomplish the goals that you set together. At Jameson, this I would say is what is our primary pillar, communication skills, verbal skills, the way that each team member owns their relationship with the patients and with each other and how they communicate can move the needle for you. It is a balance between processes and people. So how do you maximize your team? If you want to be more profitable, it's going to take a team. You need to have clear roles and responsibilities and expectations set. I see all the time, especially in business teams, that we've hired a bunch of business team members, and yet there's still a lot of dropped balls because nobody knows who's on first. Nobody knows who's the person that's ultimately responsible for each piece of the business puzzle. So you need to clarify those roles so you eliminate, well, I thought she was going to do it. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do it. So any of that confusion can make your days more stressful and less profitable. So we want to clarify those roles and responsibilities and set expectations. Supporting that by clear systems and processes, just like I said, building the processes in your practice, and then continuously training and developing to build confidence and competence in execution. That's what we want to do. So connection time matters. You want to move the needle? You start meeting as a team and working on your skills and your systems through your huddles, through your team meetings, through quarterly longer meetings that we call brain trust. Those could be half day to full day sessions. This is where you set goals. This is where you train. This is where you plan the day. If it's a huddle, if you want a daily huddle agenda, email me. I'd be happy to send you one um, as an example of what I would want you to cover in a huddle to be as productive as possible. If you're doing team meetings, which goodness, I hope you are, I want them to have set agendas. I want you to have growth topics where you're training or reviewing systems, procedures, practicing, role-playing, talking about best practices, troubleshooting an area, planning social media, whatever the case may be, I want you all working on the business. Rotate facilitators and note takers so that you increase engagement among the team reduce the distractions, stay on time, don't forget to celebrate, and stay positive. Keep it positive. Meetings matter, but death by meeting is because you don't have an intentional process in place to make sure those meetings are effective. That's why people start stop having them. That's why there's no value in them. That's why people don't participate. But if you want to grow, you're going to have to start doing things in your practice different then you're doing them right now, which means you have to train and improve your skills and systems as a team. So what's the next step? Taking action, setting goals. So when you think about the systems in your practice, when you think about where opportunities are, what I've talked about in these 30 minutes, what can you do next? What can you do in the next 24 hours to take a step forward? Do you need to call a company? Do you need to call Lee and his team and have a lease evaluation done? Do you need to plan a team meeting? Do you need to set a goal for production? Do you need to go run reports and see what your case acceptance is right now? Whatever it is, what's the one thing you can do tomorrow to move forward? If you don't know, you can rate your practice. This is an exercise that I have, and I'm going to share with you a QR code for an ebook called Move the Needle. 
And this has some, some instruction for you on goal setting, on vision planning, on leading your team through meetings. And it also has a rate your practice exercise where you can rate your practice one through 10 on the 25 systems that I talked about earlier that you can evaluate, self-evaluate. And I would recommend that everyone on your team evaluate to see if there are opportunities for improvement. Wherever you're rating yourself low, that's what I would focus on and prioritize in growth topics in my team meetings, in evaluating with my team and training and improving that piece of the puzzle because that could be one of the systems that's holding you back from being your very best. So I wanna encourage you to, to pick up your phone, turn on your camera, and you can simply Point your camera to the QR code and it should pop up a little place that you can click to take you to a page to download this ebook. If you don't want to do any of that, you can just email me and I will send you the ebook. <laughs> so whichever way is easiest for you, I certainly want to make your life as easy as possible. Did you know for your practices that great customer service answers the question, how easy do you make it for your patients to get what they want or need? So I want you to be doing that for your patients. And I certainly want to do that for you. So I hope that you enjoy this um, ebook. And um, I'm going to be passing the baton over to Lee now for his portion of the show. Um, but I want to remind all of you, if you have questions, that you are welcome to put those in the in the Q and A or in the chat, whatever you have available to you. Lee and I will discuss those um, at the end of the session if we have the chance. Um, but we certainly want to give you an op opportunity to ask your questions. And so, Lee, I'm going to pass it over to you, my friend. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, just about. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kerry. Um, that was really fascinating. I mean, I. Obviously, we've worked together before in the past, but I would so strongly recommend everybody to uh, to reach out to Kerry when you have time. It's, uh, she and and uh, the the company is a fantastic resource, as I can certainly say that um, from my experience in, of Jameson. Uh, anyway, so on my part of the uh, the presentation. Um, we are the purpose of, of, of my part. We're going to talk a little bit about purchasing versus uh, leasing in the real estate, uh, how to choose the kind of uh, the practice that, that suits you. Should you expand, renovate, relocate? Uh, we're going to look at some tips and tricks on how to maximize your financial and business wins in your next lease negotiation. Um, we're really just going to take a deep dive into um the, the leasing side of your business and why it's so important. Um, my goal tonight is not to make you uh, experts, but certainly to to give you a little understanding of, of why it's uh, such an important part of your practice. So who are we? Uh, why are we, why do we exist? Uh, so Cirrus, we've been around for around 30 years now. Uh, successfully helping dental and healthcare professionals. Um, we've negotiated over 13,000 healthcare specific leases. I would say 75 to 80% of our clients are uh, dentists. We do do other healthcare professionals, veterinarians, general practitioners, health and wellness, uh, podiatrists, rheumatologists, we really do uh, cover healthcare um, completely. Um, so what makes us unique? We do everything in house. We have a team of real estate um, with lease negotiators, some with a background in healthcare, some former real estate uh, attorneys, and uh, some who actually we've retained from the landlord side as well, the, the dark side, as we say. Um, myself, I'm one of the, the senior consultants. Um, so I lecture uh, across the country, giving continuing education seminars on the business side of, of, of dentistry. And that's a little bit about us. We also pay for um, a lot of proprietary data from a, from a, real, estate uh, a real estate perspective. We do have access to over 95 billion square foot 
uh, of information that we pay a large amount of, month, uh, of money each month uh, just to give us a kind of idea of the, the current rental rates, vacancies, a little bit more detail about the specific property that you're actually in or if you're looking for a different space. Um, I can certainly, and another, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, dig in a little bit deeper. But I did pull a couple of reports before uh, tonight's webinar, just to kind of have a little glance at some of the the, the main markets. Um, as you can see, in New York, in Dallas, uh, you know, the rental rates did start to to come down um, during COVID, and vacancy rates increased as expected, but. Even though vacancy rates are still continue to, to rise, the, the rents are starting to go back up as well. Uh, that seems to be a very sort of similar trend. I mean, in, in Atlanta, it didn't even see much of a dip in the rental rates, even during COVID. Um, LA, there was a little bit in the sort of 23 uh, last year. But again, the forecast going forward is the rental rates are still going to continue to rise. So if we look at sort of cost reduction from a, a lease perspective, to me, there's kind of two sides to your lease. There's the financial and the legal uh, side of your lease. Um, before we get too granular, there's, there's seven financial negotiables in your new lease. Now, if you think about more from uh, the perspective of starting your own practice from scratch, if that's what some of you uh, listening tonight are thinking about doing. There are seven key financial negotiables. The base rent, the annual increase. Does the rent increase each, each year with inflation or, or above? There's your common area maintenance. Most leases that we see today are a triple net lease, which essentially means that you'll pay a base rent and you'll pay an additional dollar the square foot um, value for your common area and maintenance. Fixturing period. So when you actually get possession of the space, you may not commence for a few months during that fixturing period. We don't want to be paying any rent then. And we also want to get some free rent even after you've actually opened the doors on day one, because not necessarily you're, you know, you hope to be busy, but it might take a while to start building up new patients. Is there any tenant improvement allowance? Will, you know, the landlord, you obviously want them to have some skin in the game. Now, there's never such thing as free money, um, but we certainly want the landlord to, to help where we can um, in terms of the landlord work and, and what that will look like and what they'll do to the space before you, you know, start building out this, the dream practice. So what should the office lease do for you? So it should provide fair and affordable financial terms, as we've discussed. Want to make sure that the rents are in line with the current rental rates um, over not just now, but, but for a longer term period. We want to have some long term stability and security. There's no point starting a practice, even if you acquire a new one, or build out one. You, you're looking at a million dollar plus investment. We want, therefore, to have a lease that has the sort of longevity for at least 10 to 20 years. So you don't have to worry that, you know, you're not going to be able to renew the lease or there's going to be some sort of demolition or relocation uh, in the lease. And we want to minimize the risk and exposure. So some of that is in terms of if there's any sort of personal guarantees, any sort of liability um, from that perspective. And we want to maximize your flexibility as well. So is there an opportunity, maybe not now when you start practice, um, but if the practice is successful and, and grows and you have the opportunity to expand, you want to have that sort of first right of refusal. You don't want to be, you know, thinking, I really could do with some more space. And before you know it, the, the, the next, the adjacent space has just had a new tenant come in and you had no idea about it. So there's certain things that we can do to add value to the lease, which essentially adds value to your practice, right? Whether it's some sort of exclusivity, so there's no other general dentist that can come into the space, um, minimizing some of the, the exposure, and like I said, maximizing your flexibility. 
And finally, you want to enhance your ability to eventually sell your practice. So how do you maximize your leverage? Well, you are the other best tenants on the planet, right? If you think about from a landlord perspective, and I, and I have this all the time, the conversation with, with clients always saying, oh, my landlord won't do anything and he won't change anything and he won't do anything for me. And, you know, it's it's really just about educating the, the landlord and, and, and yourself, really. Um, if you do the math, you think about that, tenancy expense that you're going to actually um, invest or, or put into the space over that period of time. I mean, even if I just, you know, even if we just took a rough example of a $5,000 rent, monthly rental expense with an annual increase of 3%, you stay in the practice for over 30 years, you're looking at 2.9 million that you would have spent on tenancy expenses. Now, Probably a lot of you are looking at that thinking, I need to buy the building. But there are pros and cons of, of owning and, and leasing, which we'll touch on a little bit later. I mean, my main point here is that, you know, you're not a restaurant. A restaurant, you know, changes hands every couple of years. You're not a nail salon. You're not a, you know, uh, a dry cleaner. Um, you, you, you can't just move over on the weekend. And statistically, dentists or healthcare professionals will stay in their space for well over 20 years. So you have leverage. So I, I did bring up, a, uh, I asked my team just to pull up a couple of examples of some of the sort of situations that we've been involved in and had success with a client mid-career in, in Long Beach that was, you know, originally came to us to renew um, their lease, but found out that the, the, the landlord had some plans for the building in the future. So the client really was unsure whether to renew for the short term, but knew that kind of move was in, in, inevitable. I mean, in the end, for this example, we ended up relocating practice to uh, another space. We had the new landlord contribute over 150000 towards the client practice on top of um, rent-free 45000 10-year term, over um, with, with two five-year options on an 18, uh, 100 square foot space. So we were able to, you know, put the, put the client, uh, deal with the situation, the problem that was going to arise in the future uh, and, and get the landlord, the new landlord to pay for quite a considerable, considerable amount on the uh, new build out. Um, so Similar uh, situation in, in Boston, um, where a landlord wanted an 11% increase on the, the client's rent that was, you know, the lease was coming up for, for expiry. We, uh, we ended up negotiating the same rent with only one, with, with a 3% increase, with a savings of just under 40,000 over uh, a five year lease term, plus two five year options, et cetera. So, you know, Landlords, I mean, it's quite common now with the inflation that landlords will try to increase the rent, you know, exponentially. Um, but there is a negotiation. Everything is negotiable. And in New York, we had originally client came to us again to renew, they explored the terms of the renewal uh, agreement. This is a, another mid-career in New York. And again, we we're able to relocate the client um, and get the landlord to pay for quite a substantial amount of the building. So, I mean, listen, we, we're remunified directly by you, the client. We, we don't derive any commission. We're not in the business. Like if you can stay at the space and you don't have to move, wonderful. But there's plenty of situations where a move is forced upon you, um, whether it's from landlord you know, inserting a demolition clause or these things hanging over you, don't just wait, like Kerry said, right? You know, you have to be proactive. You have to actually you know, make some of these decisions and potentially make some of these moves that may cost you in the short term, but will certainly pay for itself in the long term. Um, so some profitable growth. So, you know, this is the provision, the use provision within the lease, essentially allows, you know, what, what you can and can't operate in a dental office. Um, 
So we've had situations here where, you know, you're solely for the purpose of offering a dental office. Now, you and, and us and the American Dental Association, I mean, we understand what a dental office does. But if you are bringing in specialists, if there are any additional kind of speciality forms of dentistry that you, you want to practice, or if, you, if you're doing ortho or Invisalign or sleep apnea or Botox, you need to make sure that the use provision is broad enough that you can actually um, provide those kind of services within the practice. We touched on this before in terms of you know, buying versus leasing. In terms of buying versus leasing. I'm hoping everyone can see my slides here. Sorry, hold on a second. Apparently it's not in presentation mode, so my apologies, hold on a second. I hope everyone can still see that now. My apologies, um, we're having a slight technical issue here. Um, so in terms of careful planning when it comes to transition, so there are a number of provisions within the lease that we look at, the assignment, rental rates, uh, death and disability, personal guarantee. Now, I think we're gonna to touch on one, I'm gonna give you one example tonight. But again, what I'm trying to explain is that there, most people will look at the lease, they will look at the sort of financials, how much are they paying, with regards to term and, and rent. And then likelihood is that they will probably put the other 40 pages uh, of the lease in, in a drawer and not look at it for a long time until they have to. Um, you know, our job is to, to read these leases on a daily basis. Um, and there are a number of other uh, provisions, as you can see here, that can have a really detrimental impact on the practice. Uh, you know, demolition, relocation, is there any personal guarantees? Is there what sort of exclusivity? Um, and then there's the, the assignment clause. Now, the assignment clause is one of the most important um, provisions within the lease. It really does occur when uh, in conjunction with the, the sale or acquisition of, a, of the practice, um, I have here uh, an example of an assignment provision, which um, I'm going to just ask you to have a quick look at, and then we'll we'll go through it. But for the for the interest of, of time, um, so this is a uh, a provision that's found in 75% of dental leases, um, and as you will see as as we as we go through it, why just this one provision and and how. Uh, expensive it can be or, or problematic it can be if, it, if it's not structured specifically to you and, and the, the dental practice. Because 
you have to get, you know, you have to get prior written consent from the landlord to transfer the lease, as you can see here. Now, again, this is pretty common. No landlord is going to let you transfer the practice to, to anybody without having some sort of, you know, idea of, of who you're willing to bring in. So they have to have received consent from the landlord. Now, landlords shall have, in this case, three options. Now, the first option is just to approve the tenant's request to assign the lease or sublet the premises. Two, can simply decline the tenant's request to assign the lease. And three, just for asking permission from the landlord to assign the lease, they can just terminate the lease agreement upon effective date of such proposed lease assignment or sublet. In some cases, actually negotiate with a with, with the potential buyer um, without you involved yourself. Now here it says landlords shall have the right to revise the minimum rent to be paid during the remainder of the term to the greater of the current market rent for the lease premise or 15% greater than the current market. So even if you say you've got landlords willing to approve the, the request, just from this, they can then actually increase the rent by 15%. Now, if I'm buying your practice and I'm taking over this lease and suddenly I'm hit with a 15% rent, rent increase. I mean, the first thing I'm going to do is, is, is want a, you know, a 15% reduction in the purchase price that I'm paying for the practice. It gets worse, unfortunately, but uh, as we know, uh, with a large financial transaction that's going to take place within a dental practice when it, when it comes to sell, um, any consideration from the sale of the tenant's business with respect to the location of the premise, but not tenant business goodwill inventory, shall be payable to the landlord. So even if they were to take out some of the, you know, not necessarily your, your goodwill, landlords will actually say, well, you know, some of your equipment or some of, of your uh, trade fixtures specifically, um, they have a value and that they want some of that consideration to actually transfer the lease. I had a client who uh, was in his 70s who tried to sell his practice three times. This was a $2 million practice, three times. I mean, he was literally out, done. Um, in the end, he had to actually cut a check for $263,000 to the landlord just to, to approve the transfer. He took his 1.7 million and he was gone. He simply just had enough. I know there's a few people who've got a few questions. We will touch on them uh, shortly when we, when we get there. And then finally, um, any assignments of the tenant shall not be released from obligations under the lease and shall remain liable for any failure of the tenant or its society. So you've got through the first three or four provisions. You finally agreed for the landlord to transfer the lease to the new buyer, but you're still remain, remaining continually liable for the lease, even after sale. I had a client that sold his practice in 2019, young, uh, buyer been associating for a few years, took over the space. COVID came, kicked in. Client unfortunately took on too much debt and, and went bankrupt and was three months in arrears of rent and he owed about $20,000. Landlord phoned up the seller who had now been on a beach or, you know, and retired for three years and said, you know, sorry, doctor, to be the bearer of bad news, but your buyer who you sold the practice to has been in arrears of uh, rent for three months. Um, he owes $20,000 plus there's another seven years left of the rent. Now, the last thing this doctor wants to do is come back and start practicing dentistry again. So just that one provision, cost of that mistake, inability to sell the practice, 
having to absorb a significant increase in rent if you remain liable as a guarantor beyond sale, paying the landlord a portion of your sale credit. I mean, it could be anywhere from $250,000 to $750,000 uh, cost. Um, so this slide I actually got from one of my colleagues who used to work on the landlord side. So we always recommend starting the process for a renewal two years before expiry. The reason being is, again, leverage, um, and it can take it can take a long time if you were forced to actually relocate to actually build out and find another practice. So that blue first sort of twelve months, we certainly like to start that process. Again, gives you leverage, even if you don't want to move, and the last thing you want to do, um, landlord doesn't have to know that. And a landlord can, you know, take their time. I mean, plenty of them will just try to run the clock and try and get into this sort of orange to red area because they know once you get to this kind of eight months, six months, and now some of you will will have, if you have some options, you will have to give a, a certain time notice period if you want to extend that option. Normally that can be from anywhere from six months, nine months, a year, um, Again, it's just important to know the critical dates of, of that. But in some cases, people just think, well, I can't have a conversation. I can't discuss it for six months before expiry. But when you get to that six months, the, the chances of you moving are pretty much gone because landlord knows that you don't have enough time to, to make that move. And you're going to pretty much sign anything that they put in front of you. So be aware of, of your critical dates. Um, that's really important. So why are Cirrus, why have we been so successful for over 30 years? And, you know, what's our, what's our process? What's our secret? Um, some of the strategies for, for, for winning lease negotiations. So I've been at Cirrus for nearly six years now. Um, and what I can tell you is it's a very, um, you know, fluid process. Um, whereby you know we we gather all the documentation that's the first thing we want to understand what's the current situation um and then we want to identify some of your practice and career goals where are you at are you looking to sell are you starting a practice you mid career so we want to align the lease strategy with your current you know situation and and where you're at so we will review the office lease for the sort of risks and, and any sort of liabilities and areas of concern. And then we prepare with some of the market research. So whether that's, you know, pulling up some reports on the actual building reports, the building summary, the rent, the rent, the vacancies, and also who's the landlord? Is it a big institutional landlord? Somebody that we worked with before? Is it a small mum and pup? Like understanding a lot more about the the market that we're dealing with and then we want to um develop a strategy um for for an outcome and what have we we what have we not done at this stage i mean there's five um you know kind of points that i mentioned here and what we haven't done at this point we haven't reached out to the landlord now a common mistake is and and i and i ask you you know to understand what your lease says but i also you know uh, don't make the mistake of you know looking at the lease or phoning a landlord and saying, "Do I have this in my lease? Do I have that in my lease?" And, and I don't want to move. And you know, again, it, it's a choreograph game of chess um, or poker, depending on on what you what you prefer. But you know, we've done all these things, and now we will reach out to the landlord, and we want to negotiate some of the financials because, again, from our experience. Once we have a landlord motivi motivated by the financials, they're much more willing to make the legal changes to bring the necessary protection to your practice. So we will still spend 15, 25 hours back and forth on the lease ne negotiating the terms. And then we do a final review and an execution to make sure that the lease that we've agreed or we've negotiated is, is um, you know, comparable and aligned to to what you've signed. Now, 
We do at Cirrus uh, have what we call a, a critical dates risk analysis, or essentially it's a consultation where if you do have an existing lease, uh, we would spend sort of three to four hours analyzing your lease for any traps. Um, we would then get on a call, discover kind of where you're at, your, your vision, your plan, um, uncover some of the, the, the traps and, and some of the liabilities in the lease and what the ideal lease should look like and make an effective plan. Now this does have a $2,000 value, um, but uh, we are offering it complimentary on a first come first uh, sort of basis tonight for any of your any attendees. And even if you haven't got a lease or if you own a building or if you're looking to start a practice, we'll still offer a consultation you know, again, where I'll, I'll spend some time and understand where you're at and see how we can assist. So uh, I strongly encourage you to to take up the the this review because it's extremely beneficial. Um, I am going to also just so we did have. Um, I'm just stop share and see if we have any questions. Uh, any questions? If you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the um, put them in the question and answer session. Kerry, welcome back. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say to everyone while we're kind of waiting to see if anyone has any questions, is I've actually um, introduced some contacts, some doctors um, to Cirrus for this particular service when it's available because I think it's really valuable. Um, so, I mean, such a valuable amount of time and um, service that you would be providing for anyone that doesn't really know if the issues that they're struggling with are something that they can that they can work out or or what the opportunities even are. Um, so I highly recommend that anyone that is, you know, that that's looking for that or is even remotely curious, um, especially if you're starting out a practice to um to have these conversations with you all it's a very very valuable time spent with the experts um i yeah. highly recommend that practices reach out to the experts <laughs> thank you carrie um i have put up um a poll there's a few more sort of questions at the end and i would appreciate if, if you take a minute just to, to fill that out if you're if you're interested in a consultation with myself or, or carrie um feel free we, we would love to spend some time you know on a little bit more uh one-on-one -on -one so we can understand a little bit more about your sort of situation and if you do have any questions uh, we're just over over the hour mark we can start a little bit later um one question yes we can definitely do that um sorry someone wanted us to send something uh, any other questions? Don't be shy. Now is a good time. Put it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to let everybody enjoy the rest of their evening. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Lee, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, you know, you can be doing a lot of things right now. And so we're certainly grateful that you chose to, to spend some time with the two of us. So thank you so much. And if you didn't uh, get a chance to download the ebook that I shared, um, feel free to email me at, um, you can just do info at jmsn.com and request the Move the Needle ebook. And I'd be happy to provide that to you. Okay. So see if there's a question so someone will use Cirrus in a couple of years to sell their practice which is great we just want to make sure that that your lease and everything is in place um maybe before that but appreciate that um okay i think that that's it i don't, I don't see any uh, additional questions and i am conscious of people's time i do appreciate everyone for for joining us and um, we wish you a, a, a nice evening and we will speak to you all soon thanks carrie thank you all take care bye-bye